Thank you very, very much indeed for the introduction. And uh, firstly, just to echo your thanks to all of you for coming this evening, in particular to Caroline uh, for coming uh, today. Um, Caroline, what these events have been about is trying to get to the root of what took leading national politicians into politics at all. Why politics and not uh, dressmaking? Uh, why Labour and not uh, Conservative or whatever? So what I'm going to do this evening is just to ask you about your own history. What formed you when you came to big choices? Firstly, before you got into politics at all, but then as you then went through a very stellar political career, you had to take various decisions at various points. What drove you in taking those decisions and what do you think you achieved uh, in politics? And I'm going to start with your uh, childhood. I, I think you uh, were living in southwest London in Twickenham. You went to uh, Twickenham Girls' School um, and then from there, Richmond Tertiary College, and then you came here to UEA. Can you just talk a bit about your family, you? I know you joined the Labour Party when you were 17, which is pretty young. Why was that? Was it rebellion? Was it consistent with your family? Whatever. Can you just talk a little bit about you from that point well, of view? So, so, um, so on my mother's side, um, and I say my mother's side because I don't know who my biological father is. My mother had me at, at 17, so I've never known my real dad. Um, so on my mother's side, they originated from the northwest up in the Lake District and uh, in a little place called Burneyside near Kendall where there's a, there still is a paper mill, it's called Croppers. It does sound like this Victorian uh, novel um, and experience. And um, my grandma in particular, Beatty, Beatrice, um, decided that with her husband they wanted to do something else. So they ended up um, managing pubs. Uh, which was interesting because I've actually got a photograph of my, my grandmother and some of her brothers and sisters in the local temperance league uh, that existed. I think it was the closest to a disco, actually, <laughs> in those days. But anyway, they ended up in the pub trade and they managed pubs in uh, the north of England, in Yorkshire as well, and made their way to the south. And, uh, and that's why I'm a Londoner and in that sense not uh, got a northern accent. And so when my mum had me at 17, I was very lucky in many respects because it was 1961 and for a lot of young women they probably have had to give up their child under those circumstances but uh, my grandparents uh, decided to support my mum so I lived my first few, few, few years in the Jolly Blacksmith in Twickenham which was the pub that my grandparents married. There is a story in my family that my, um, my grandma offered to actually raise me as her own uh, and that therefore my mum would be my sister. And I think in a lot of families, that was one of the ways of dealing with those sort of things. Except, you know, my grandma was 40 when she had my mum, so she was 57 by that stage, and uh, uh, that was probably going to stretch it a bit, I can imagine. <laughs> but anyway, there we are. And so on my birth certificate, I am Caroline Louise Beasley, which is my mum's uh, maiden name. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, my mum married uh, Peter Flint, and, uh, and we ended up moving away from Twickenham and our, the first home we had uh, was in uh, Clapham Junction. We lived in a, actually it was a sort of one bedroom rented place and uh, by that time as well my sister had come along, she's about three, my half sister, she's about three and a half years young, younger than me and Peter Flint sold TVs in the DER shop below and uh, we had this, I think, one bedroom, because I do remember at one point, uh, my sister and I slept on one side of the wardrobes, if you like. So my mum, and now he adopted me as well, Peter Flint, were on one side of the wardrobes and we were on the other. And so my first uh, school was in, in Clapham. And then, you know, over the years, sort of, you know, my brother came along and we moved back to Twickenham. And in fact, we lived in the private rented sector and we lived in St Mary's Terrace, in which my, if you like, Peter Flint's mum lived in the same street. And it was one of those streets where um, everybody knew everybody. Everyone was in and out of each other's houses. And the great thing about it was, it, you know, it was private rented sector, but it was that era, Charles, where, you know, rents were pretty, yeah. you know, organised. You know, there were no shocks, but also you could live out you know, without these six-month turnaround contracts, a pretty stable life. And I went to St Mary's Junior School, and as you said, went to Twickenham Girls' School. I was the first year of the comprehensive intake into that school. And then went to, we ha and interestingly, actually, this it was Richmond-upon-Thames, which is a conservative, yeah. you know, area, pretty much. Is that Goldsmith these yeah. days? Yeah, but in those days, you know, they, they um, 
created this tertiary college. In fact, Shirley Williams came to open it up a bit before I went there. And they had hardly any sixth forms in any of the schools. Yeah. And so I went there. Now, politics, where did I get into it? Look, well, my before, just yeah, before what you, you described that, okay. was it a happy childhood? Was it a very stressed well, childhood? Did you find it tough? You had two siblings that you were yeah, yeah. there with. How, how yeah. do you feel when you look back on it? The first part of my childhood um, was, was great, it was fine, you know. And in fact, I didn't find out that um, Peter Flint wasn't my biological dad until I was about the age of 10. Um, I found out partly because I was being nosy and I was rummaging around some boxes of photographs and things like this and I happened to come across this baptism mm. certificate that had Caroline Beasley on it. Mm. I then found an adoption certificate as I started to nose around a bit more and, uh, and what they used to do you know, on those, and I'm not sure if it's changed today, it had my mum's name on it and Peter Flint's name on it and I actually thought I was adopted by both of them. Mm. And physically, I didn't really look that much like my half-brother and sister. My brother is blonde hair and blue eyes. Mm. And so I always thought I was a bit of a changeling child, you know. And then I thought, this is the proof, you know. So I was about 10, 11. And then we had a family discussion about it all, and I didn't really think about it. The difficult stages was more happening in my teens, because when I was about 13, and, and by the way, um, both my mum and Peter Flint went into the pub business as well. My mum had worked in shops and as a barmaid before that um, and they decided to try and you know, manage pubs and then that went okay for a while and we moved around quite a lot in that part of London. I mean because you know, I think you know, we just moved with them mm. to the different pubs that they were man managing and I think over a period of about two or three years we must have lived in about eight different pubs. Um, but they broke up and, and then you know, things got quite difficult. Uh, my mum lived with someone else, but she became clear during my teens that she was having a really bad drink problem, mm. and she became an alcoholic. Mm. And that was something that overshadowed, that overshadowed pretty much all my life going forward until she died at the age of 45. And it was difficult. Very tough, I can imagine. It I was. mean, Liam Byrne talked in the Parliament this, this week about his alcoholic background. Mo Mo, I remember, I knew very well. Her father's an alcoholic. That must have been a very tough part of it's, your life. Um, it's something you didn't feel you could talk about. Yeah. And what I would say as well, it's you love this person, but there are times when you hate them as well. Because once the drink takes control, they're not in control. And that was difficult. And I think, as I, in my teens as well, trying to understand why my mum wasn't being strong enough, what it was about her self-esteem that she felt so bad about herself, that she had to rely on drink. And that, for me, I think, started my values, I suppose, mm. about where was the help for my mum, where was the help for her to realise that she hadn't mucked up her whole life. And I suppose in that, Charles, as well, I felt a certain responsibility had I mucked up my mum's life by her keeping me. Mm. And I think, you know, as I say, as I got older and tried to think about values and politics and help and for me that sort of started to crystallise something about what I wanted to do differently, the sort of politics I wanted to be involved in, about people having not just a second chance in life, you can have a third chance, you can have a fourth chance mm -hmm. and also about you know just how for so many children their expectations about what they can achieve and do can be so determined not just by their postcode, by by what their parents are yeah. and what their parents have believe and what they have access to and whether or not they are in a situation where they can offer the aspiration that their kids need. And it's not blaming the parents, although I think you have to take responsibility when you've got an addiction, but I think it's just one of those things. And children are incredibly resilient in that situation, but also limited by what it does to them as well. What's striking is that this took you towards... Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's very, very compelling. What's striking is that this took you towards politics. Yeah. Uh, it could have taken you towards other types of activity, but it was politics and then Labour politics. Mm -hmm. In a sense, mm -hmm. looking at it from the outside, I can see why Labour politics was the value that you began to espouse, as to try and mm -hmm. uh, see the situation. But was it obvious? Were you always going to get involved in politics once you... My, uh, my family wasn't at all political. I mean, we were work, working class, but it wasn't organised working class. Yeah. I don't think, you know, uh, they never worked in a place which was unionised, for example. Mm. 
So that wasn't a feature of, of growing up. Mm. Um, at the girls' school, I have to say, you know, there was, you know, a sort of sense of speaking up yeah. too. I mean, when I, I loved history at school, and, uh, and I suppose in some respects, you know, over the years, you know, young people have come to work for me and said, oh, did you study politics, you know? And I, and I didn't in that sense. But studying history, and to a certain extent literature as well, particularly, you know, that contemporary literature of the period in which you're studying, studying history, sort of said to me that you could change things. Mm. I mean, it might be slow, <laughs> but you can actually change things. And people, you know, can shape the future uh, and learn from the past as well. And so when I was at this girls' school, I loved history, I loved literature. We had a debating society. So speaking up in a more formal sense was part of what I did as well. I have to say, I loved, I went to dance school. I loved dancing, I liked performing, I liked acting. I played earnest in the importance of being earnest at my girls' school, um, as you do in those situations in single sex education. But I think there also were teachers there who, to be honest, I don't think they knew what was going on at home. But my school became a sanctuary for me. It was, there was structure and routine there and ways in which I could get away with what was going on at home and, uh, and live that part of my life in a way that, protected by some of the things that were happening at home. And, uh, and, th and the truth is, is that when I went to the FE college, I think the game changer there was, was there was a student union, yeah. there was a labor club, yeah. there was the Nicaraguan solidarity campaign, there was the women's group, you know, and suddenly, you know, there were these sort of clubs and societies in which I could really sort of think about, you know, some of the things I was thinking about unfairness and opportunity and, and see what was on offer. Was and it the Labour Club was an offer. Was it always obvious at that stage of your life, your late teens, that you'd try to go to university if you could? Yes. yes. Um, I'm the first in my family to go to university. Mm. Um, my brother and sister, actually, who are younger than me, left school at 16 mm. and went to work. Mm. They always thought I was odd. You know, you know, I'd come back from university, from UEA, my donkey jacket, and my, I, I'm very short-sighted without the contact lens, my a NHS glasses. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, I can remember my sister was working in, uh, she was working in, in a sort of, uh, you know, travel shop, you know, mm. selling holidays. And so she dressed up in a certain way <laughs> to work in the travel shop. And I'd be coming back, you know, with the dungarees on and things like this. And she, Say it's ridiculous. Or things. <laughs> there was a bit of a climatizing to, to all of that. But no, I had this sort of thing, and I suppose there must have been some people along the way at school who just, I just thought if I could, I didn't really know, I didn't have reference points. To be honest, I suppose on one level, I ended up choosing the A-level subjects that I liked at O-level, and then uh, as a degree as well. So I did American history and literature here, uh, because that's what I knew. Um, but I just thought if I could get to university, I could have some different opportunities. I could make, I could have more control. I could have make some more choices, um, and that was amazing. That was amazing. So tell us a little bit about your time here at UEA. <laughs> Students here this evening will be interested to hear how you found it and uh, how it formed you and how your yeah, political yeah. thoughts began to move on. So I mean, it was just quite scary. Um, I mean, I was on a full grant. I mean, I worked in every holiday. Mm. I mean, I, I, there was, I had no cushioning on, on that sort of thing. In fact, I, you know, so I, I worked at a baked bean factory not far from here. I spent a summer putting spaghetti into cans and, uh, and when the beans came in from the farm and they were on this massive conveyor belt, putting my hands in with all the other women because there was a lot of job gender segregation when it came to the work tasks, I can tell you that much. And picking up the stones, picking up the sticks before they went off to be the baked beans and things like this. Um, but it was, no, I mean, it was, it was overwhelming a bit. I have to say, I probably thought at the time that actually the Sainsbury's was actually a Sainsbury's rather than uh, the fine arts centre that actually <laughs> really is. Um, but no, I mean, it was, um, I'd already, because I'd been at the FE College and been involved with the Labour Club there and joined the Labour Party, I joined the Labour Party in 1979, which yeah. was an interesting year in itself. My first branch meeting, because it was Twickenham Labour Party, um, the item under discussion was how to deselect your Labour MP. <laughs> um, Thank, as you God, get, thank, thank God those days have <laughs> <like>, passed. <laughs> I was saying, uh, I, had, I, had, I met with some of the, uh, the UEA Labour students, and I was saying, I told them this story as well, and I said, you know, it's amazing how, 
Um, you know, as you get older, time passes, things go around and come around. But anyway, but what was more, even more bizarre, so there I am, I'm 17, I, you know, I, you know, I have no reference points for my own family, the Labour Party. The Labour Club was great and involved in the student union and campaigning, and I go to my first branch meeting, and this item's under discussion, and of course Twickenham has never had a Labour MP. That made it even more bizarre, really, you know. But, so I had a bit of that behind me and was involved in Labour students as an FE student as well, so... You know, arriving here, uh, you know, I joined the Labour Club and joined the local Labour Party here yeah. in Norwich. So I wasn't just a, yeah, yeah. up here on the campus. And, it, you know, it was. I mean, I, I, I should say as well is that with things going on with my family as well, I think, there's, you know, it's also provided me with something, a certain certainty and thing I could be involved in that wasn't embroiled in some of that. Mm -hmm. So let me give you something here about being here as well and how different it is. I joined Nightline when I was here, the counselling, and, um, and I did the training for it and wanted to do that, you know, because, again, I may be thinking, you know, sometimes people need to sort of chat to someone when things aren't great. But I have to say it was a lifeline for me as well, because in those days, of course, we didn't have mobile phones. And the truth is, we did have a phone in the Nightline office at night, and I would ring my sister earlier in the day on a payphone and say, I'm going to be doing a shift tonight between 11 and 6 in the morning. Uh, they had obviously a landline back at the mm. flat. We were in a council flat mm. by this stage um, in, in Hounslow. I said, ring me up. And it was one of my the best ways. Sorry, Nightline, but you helped me as well. <laughs> it was one of my best ways to just keep in touch with my sister about what was going on at home. Mm. Um, and, you know, and to try and be there for, for them as well. But, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I was, I mean, um, our colleague Ian Gibson, for example, <laughs> he was on the, I think I was on, I was a student rep on the, the Joint Trades Council and he was on there as well as the dean he was at the time. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a, you know, amazing sort of time to be at a university in that period, but also quite a difficult time as well. And, of course, I was here during the 1983 general election. Yeah. And, and I remember Michael Foote coming to do a, 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 a rally here in, here in Norwich. It was amazing. Undoubtedly, he was brilliant. Mm. But I was then here on the night of the general election in 83 when we lost so badly here and around the country. And I think, again, it, it, all of that period honed my thoughts about, yes, of course we should you know, be passionate about our politics, our principles and everything else, but if we can't win elections, then you know we don't have power. And you can talk to ourselves, but if we're not reaching out and listening to others, I'm afraid you lose contact. Now, you, you, during that period, you also got involved in the national organisation of Labour. Yes, I did. Sorry. Um, and uh, there's another defining point. I mean, obviously, a defining point in your life was joining Labour, getting involved in yeah. Labour politics. But you became the woman's officer yeah, of the national organisation of Labour students, and a recurrent theme in your life has been fighting for the position of women. Yeah. Um, and you made various remarks at later points in your life which drew attention to this too. Can you just talk about that motivation in your life? What led you, even at that relatively young age, to say you wanted to be a women's <coughs> officer yeah. specifically? Has it been an important dimension? Does it reflect to your family history yes. that you were talking about earlier on? Definitely. Can you just talk, talk, talk us through that a little bit? Well, as I say, I, I, interesting. I mean, the day I joined the Labour Club at FE College, I joined the women's group at the same time. Mm. And, and I suppose, Charles, part of it was that I always felt that just a sort of, if you like, a class analysis of politics wasn't enough. Mm. You, you had to look beyond that. And, uh, and I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm sure you are. I'm very proud of the Labour Party because, you know, in so many ways, um, we have been at the forefront of fighting for equality, but it's not always been as great as you might think. And therefore, you know, back in those days, in the sort of, you know, through the, throughout the 80s, I think, again, you know, I felt that part of what we had to fight for within Labour students and in the wider party is an appreciation that actually, you know, discrimination and inequality doesn't always boil down to some a class analysis of these things. There's something else going on, and that's whether you're dealing with racism or feminism or, um, uh, or, or, or anything else for that matter. So it was important to me uh, because the truth is, is that, you know, we still have a situation where, you know, we may have laws it's one thing to have a law, but it doesn't always necessarily change the way people think about things. And when you, you know, things like everyday sexism, I mean, my, I, have a, I have a two sons and a daughter, my daughter is 27. And, um, and in different ways, they're still facing, she's still facing 
uh, sexism and discrimination and, and attitudes that still exist. So it was, it was, and it was always very important to me. I think some of us in Labour, women in Labour students, scared the hell out of the men as well. I have to say, uh, I that was part that. of the job. I can tell you that, was <laughs> that was part. Of, that was part of the task too. And I, I do have to say, um, you know, uh, we, you know, when it came up to certain things, you know, um, in terms of delegations. You know, we be always saying, right, we want to have half the women on that delegation. So I did go to Nicaragua on, on, with the International Union of Socialist Youth, Socialist Youth, and I went to Russia on, a, on another thing as well. In fact, when I went to Russia, this is, um, there were four of us that went. In fact, John Mann uh, was, who's an MP now mm -hmm. as well, he was involved in Labour Student. He was there as well. But there was John Mann, and there was three women. I think the Russians. Well, actually, it was the Soviet Union at that time. That's how long ago it was nearly fell off their seats like this because um, we had this uh, we had this particular guide called Sasha I think his name was firstly he was about 40 odd which we thought was a bit weird because we were like 20 uh, but also he arrived with an Adidas bag which clinked and that's because it was full of vodka and I think his plan <laughs> his wicked communist plan was to basically ply us with vodka for the whole of the trip so we just go back and say we had a wonderful time and wasn't quite sure how to deal with these three feminist women that were on the delegation. Not that we didn't like a glass of vodka, but there are limits to what you want to do. But I think it has been important to me, and it always has been. And uh, because I think when it comes to equality, it isn't enough to have it on your letterhead as an organisation. You have to strive every day to make sure you put it into practice. And in politics, as in other walks of life, uh, women still aren't there in the numbers, and not just in the numbers, but at the top of the organisations where the power really lies uh, where they should be. And just to emphasise the point, I mean, I was involved in student politics 10 years before you were, but uh, even at that point, the women coming together as a group was a massive, massive force for change, mm -hmm. simply refusing to accept that things should go on as they were, and in all kinds of ways, some trivial, some deeply important, and it was very, very important. Um, you then left UEA, left student politics. You got in, You started working with the In London Education yeah. Authority for Lambeth Council, then the General Municipal Workers Union, the GMB, where you were an officer, and you started looking for parliamentary seats. What led you to... Were you always clear that if you could get an MP's role, you would? Uh, was it something that people just pushed you on? I mean, as you know, we competed uh, for this particular seat. I know. <laughs> uh, and, of course, the best man won. Uh, but, uh, 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 I wish it had been the other way around. No, I don't, actually. No, no you, don't. Don't. you don't. You don't. No, 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 you don't. I don't. <laughs> uh, but was it always that you wanted to be an MP? How did you go about finding a seat which uh, might select you? Doncaster finally did select you, and you've been a very successful MP for Doncaster. But can you just talk a little bit yeah. about that process? I, I seriously never thought when I joined the Labour Party, I'd be a Member of Parliament. I'd never met a Member of Parliament. Um, I, I, as I said, I didn't come from a political family. Um, and, and I certainly, you know, I do sometimes get a little bit nervous about, you know, people say, well, at the age of five, I decided I was going to be the Prime Minister. And I was just sort of wondering, you know, what sort of conversations are going on in that household? But no, I don't look, that's the way things are. But I never thought I'd become an MP. I, ca I really, I, as I say, I was involved in Labour students and Women's Office of Labour students. Um, and was, you know, in that sense, active at a national level, but I was always a grassroots activist. And so I'm, I was always proud that when I did become an MP, I could say to members, I will never ask you to do a job I haven't done myself. Mm. And that includes doing the, I once cooked for a hundred. I mean, I always thought if everything, anything went wrong with the day job, I'd be fine. That was a, for a fundraiser we had when I was chair of Brentford and Isworth constituency. Um, but I came from those grassroots. I think what changed, and also just in the middle of all this, you know, working for GLC and Ilya and what have you. I did get married. I had two children, but it all went very wrong. And so I found myself in my mid twenties uh, with two children under the age of two on my own. I was on benefits for a while and I had to try and get back into work. And that was pretty hard. I had some great friends around me who helped me. Mum wasn't that helpful for mm. maybe some of the reasons I, I said earlier, but it was hard. And I suppose in that sense as well, Charles, it limited what I could do. I couldn't just go and work for an MP. Mm. I couldn't just go and do these things because I had these kids to look after. Um, and so, yes, I worked in local government, which was great. Um, and then I went to work for the GB. I think as time went on, though, and particularly after the 92 general election, um, I'd seen a few MPs. And to be honest, I, I thought I could do a job as good as them. And I think my confidence improved enormously. Uh, but also, a few years down the line, I met my husband, Phil, mm. 
um, and he was incredibly supportive as well. And so I started thinking between that period after 92 and the run up to 97 that yes, actually I think I really could, I've got something to offer. Um, it's not the same route as everybody, but it's still as valuable and a contribution it could make. But it was also the confidence as well boosting in this as well, partly from my husband-to-be, um, but also um, from fam friends as well. I went for my own constituency, Brentford and Isleworth, and one thing you know is that there's people who love you and there's probably people that don't <laughs> love you <laughs> very much as well. And that was really hard, that was really harsh, and I, I, I didn't win that one, I was quite bruised by that. But the other really good thing that was happening around that time, and you all know this because you know you were part of it as well, is you know the modernisation that Neil started doing with our party, and that's the interesting thing as well. You know, I'm often called the Blairite, but actually it was Neil Kinnock yeah. who was my, if you like, mentor about the party and rebuilding it. But the, one of the great things that we changed was one member, one vote, yeah. and so suddenly, for many of us, it wasn't just going to be the general committee dominated by delegates who would be decide who the candidate was, every single member would have a vote. So I didn't win in Brentford and Isworth, and I didn't win in here in Norwich either. I dipped my toe in the water up in Rochdale actually, um, but Lorna was the candidate there and I knew she was Lorna perfect. Susan. Yeah, I knew she was perfect mm. for that. And then I sort of, um, I decided though, that when I didn't win Brentford and Isworth, which was actually a target seat in 97. In West London. Yeah, in West London. I did decide that I wouldn't go for any seat that had less of a chance of us winning than Brentford and Isleworth. Mm. So I set a bar for myself in that sense. So then I ended up in South Yorkshire. And uh, initially I went for a seat in Barnsley, part of it was in Doncaster. Um, I didn't win it, but I went around knocking on everybody's door and they had never seen their MP. I mean, they'd already had, always had Labour MPs, but pretty much a lot of the members had never seen the MP. They certainly hadn't had them knocking on their door and sitting in their kitchen and, and having a chat about things and what have you. And, uh, and I did feel that even though I wasn't from South Yorkshire, there were certain things about me and my background that I could find some common cause with some of the people I met. Then I went for Don Valley. The first line on my brochure was, I'm not going to kid you, I'm from South Yorkshire, I'm not. Get that out of the way for a start. And then, as I say, I literally knocked on everybody's door, sat in their living rooms and what have you, and just got a huge amount of information from people about what they were concerned about, what was happening at the end of the road. So when it came to the actual nomination meetings, I'd be meeting people who I'd met in their living room or in their kitchen, and I'd be suddenly saying, and, and Mary told me about this that was happening down the end of the street. And you could see some of the favoured sons thinking, how the hell does she know about that? And I won it, I won it. They, um, on the first, first ballot, over 50%, done. Um, what I remember about that time is you need immense determination to keep going through that. You get the knockback mm. in Brentford and Isleworth mm. or uh, another, Rochdale or wherever it may be. What gave you the strength to keep going, because it is a very, very personal thing. People are judging you. They're not judging the political situation or yeah. something. They're saying, well, actually, Caroline, we don't think you're up to it. And you've got to say, well, actually, I am, and I'm going to yeah. keep going. Yeah. What made you do that? It is very up close and personal. Um, mm. I mean, in a weird sort of way, the selection process can sometimes be worse than the actual election, yeah. because obviously it's a little bit more distant. But these are people you're, you know, you have to, in your mind, I suppose, partly say, um, I may never see these people again. That's what's difficult when you go for your own constituency where you live as well, because you do have to live with them again afterwards. But I think, you know, by that point, I just thought, do you know what, I'm bloody good. I could do a really good job. I really think I could be, I wanted to be a good constituency MP. I believe in that. I always have believed mm. in the constituency link, because I think it's actually, despite everything, it's one of the really good things about our, our, our way we, um, you know, elect our representatives here in, here in the UK. Um, but also, I, I, as I said, I think I'd gone through a, a process. Um, my mother died in 1990 when I was 28, and that was a hard period. And, but as I said, I sort of came through that, and I just think I'd come through quite a lot by the time I was in my early 30s seeking selection that had steeled me. I'm often called tough. Um, I'm probably quite in my, my name, Flinty, I suppose, mm. in some respects. And I can be, I can be on occasions, but I think also within me is a sort of another side to me that, you know, just is about what I feel about things as well. 
And I think the combination of the two sort of helps. It means I think I can have huge empathy with people I meet, mm. particularly those members and constituents that I have now. But I wanted also to be, I really wanted to be part of, I thought we're now on the way to win this election. 18 years, 18 years from 1979 to 1997. And I really wanted to be part of that chance for will. us to be in government again. And I was. And how amazing to get selected as an MP and be a candidate and for your party to win. And that was an amazing feeling. And so there you were at 35, part of a massive movement. We were elected on the mm. same day. Um, and you then went through a series of different uh, governmental offices and so on in various roles. Uh, we overlapped for a short period at the Home Office mm. in uh, both ministers at the Home Office from late 2004 to the 2005 mm. election. And I can certainly say what a fantastic comrade you were during that time as a team player. Mm. Did you enjoy ministerial office? Did you prefer, some people prefer being a parliamentarian or other aspects. Yeah. Did you like being I, a minister? I, I really did enjoy it, but I, I mean it was six years, I had been a backbencher for six years before yeah. I became a minister. And, uh, and you'll know, Charles, that um, there's a lot of vying, isn't there, mm. for, for jobs and what have you, and for promotion. Um, and I think probably Despite being in the party for a long time, when it came to that sort of politics, mm. I was pretty naive. Mm. Um, when Julia Gillard became you know, the Prime Minister of Australia, I actually wrote an article for New Statesman and said, how can this girl from Barry, she was born in the same year as me, yeah. I said, how can this girl from Barry become you know, the Labour Prime Minister of Australia and we haven't got a woman yeah. in the Labour Party up there? And I described the Parliamentary Labour Party, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, Charles, I described it as being quite feudal. Because basically, and I, as I say, I don't think I really appreciated that until I was in it, is, you know, you have the king, you know, which was Tony Blair, the leader, and then you have these barons. And these barons have their knights and their squires and their serfs. And you basically got to get a baron to look after you. And then they'll say, well, you know, they could be a, you know, a PPS and we'll take them in as a junior minister. Or I'll speak to my other friend who's the baron of this and they'll get them into the whip's office and things like this. And uh, Keith Hill, who was a, one of our, remember our colleagues, an MP in South London, who my husband and I have known for many years, and he said to my husband once, you know, the problem is, is Caroline's not sucking up enough. You know, she's just, which is odd considering, you know, all us Blair Bays were all accused that we were sucking up too much, you know, and that sort of thing. And I didn't really, I don't think I appreciated that as much as I should. And, uh, um, and also, later on, when you hear stories about people, you know, demanding meetings with, Tony Blair or Gordon and stamping their feet and having a tantrum to get a job. Obviously, I didn't do enough of that either. But I have to say, despite all that, I think my time on the backbench has helped me as a minister. I really do think it helped me as a minister because when you are there at the dispatch box, having some empathy for those people who aren't ministers mm. is really important because they are your foot soldiers to support you in difficult times in the House of Commons. I think as a minister, I mean, look, when I went into the Home Office as my first ministerial job and I, <laughs> I covered all those, tackling organised crime, drugs, knives, guns and all of that, fa fascinating. But again, Paul Boateng said, you realise you're now, you know, you're in the sort of salt mines of government sort of mm. thing, that's what the Home Office said. But I really enjoyed it because I think, and I, you know, you and you because would. I know that, because I think looking after people's safety, yeah. um, because that's an important part of where people are in communities, is a huge privilege to be part of that. I and actually, I look back on my time in the Home Office, I was there two years, and then I was two years at Public Health, and it seems ridiculous, but actually, that was longer than the periods I had in other ministerial yeah. jobs. And in two years, it seems ridiculous because it's such a space, but you actually have some time to really understand it. And I've always said to colleagues, you need at least six months in a department to really get to grips with who's who, who you can trust, which organisations outside of the department you could go to, but also to find your own voice as well. Um, but I, I love that period. And I, and I like to feel that I, I'm the sort of, I used to say to civil servants in all the departments I worked in, I know this might be a stupid question, but, and I think it's really important that politicians ask what they think is the most obvious question because I'm a person who likes to know not just the theory, but once this becomes law, how is it going to be put into practice and how are all those organisations outside of Parliament we rely on, do they understand what they need to do to deliver? And if you don't get that wrong, with the best intentions of the world, laws can go 
all over the place. But it was great. And was you stayed good. in office for a while. Gordon became Prime Minister. You were Minister for Europe, a very exciting job in many ways. And then you came to another big turning point in your life. You resigned yeah. from the government. Yeah. Uh, you used the famous phrase that you, were, you saw yourself as being in Gordon's government, mm. female window mm. dressing yeah. in the government. And you talked very negatively about mm. your experience as a minister. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about okay. that aspect of things? Okay. Well, you know as well as I do, Charles, that we had the psychodrama that was the sort of <laughs> Blair Brown show, so I won't, we could be here all night talking about that. And, but look, um, when Tony did stand down and, and Gordon became Prime Minister, I, first, I moved from health and I went into actually um, as Employment and Welfare Minister, and then I went to, to DCLG to cover the housing brief. And I very much enjoyed those posts, but I have to say, it was literally, I was in... DWP for about, I don't know, it was about eight months, then I was moved to housing. When I went to the housing thing, and this is the crux of what I think, for me, personally, I didn't think was right. Um, as the uh, Minister of State for Housing, um, I was entitled to attend uh, Cabinet, which was amazing, it was great, honour to do that. And Hazel was the Secretary of State for uh, Communities and Hazel Local Government. Hazel Blears for Communities and Local Government as well. And that was all fine. Um, there was obviously other things going on in the background at that time as well about what was happening politically with the Brown administration. Um, and, uh, and then I got moved from housing to Europe, which Minister of State for Europe is also a big job. But I was basically then told, well, um, we don't want you to come to uh, Cabinet, even though it was a Cabinet role, but you can come when Europe's going to be discussed. And just bear in mind that I moved across just towards the tail end of 2008. We had European elections in 2009, and there wasn't a single cabinet that I got to go to. And I felt that it was all a bit of just me. But on the lists, you were seen as a member of the cabinet. And there were a number of women colleagues during that period under Gordon who were attending cabinet but they weren't really there as full cabinet members. And it's a bit about the problem that we've had recently. I mean, in the shadow cabinet, Jeremy has now, I think at least half of members of, women, members of the shadow cabinet are women. But obviously there was quite a lot of concern that the top jobs, if you like, and they are the top jobs, Home Office, Foreign Secretary, Chancellor, um, were not held by women. And I think at the time, you know, I felt um, that that was happening here, that we looked good, but actually when it came to power, we weren't actually really at the top table. As you look back, do you feel it was the right decision? Do you regret it? Uh, how do you feel as you reflect looking backwards? I don't regret it. Um, um, it was really hard mm. because fundamentally I am, you know, a Labour loyalist. Mm. So to speak out in the way I did was, you know, hard for me to do. But I think also I felt I had to speak up um, about something I felt strongly about, but also because, you know, I think I did work really hard as a minister. Yeah. I don't think I was one of those people, you know, demanding attention and, and, and what have you. Um, but also, uh, there were other things going on as well which made me feel um, not valued too. There was a lot of in that, in that year, 2008 through to 2009, of talk around other people now saying Gordon should go, I never did that, but I felt that for some reason um, I wasn't associated as a friend of Gordon's. Mm. And sometimes, as I say, within that atmosphere in politics, it's like you're either for us or against us. Mm. And I think I was, I, I suffered from some of that. Briefings to the press, I have never uh, briefed against a colleague to the press. If I'm going to say something, I'll say it. Mm. Um, but I was having briefings against me and it was a pretty unhappy atmosphere. And quite a difficult time in politics as well because we had the expenses stuff going on. I think for a lot of colleagues, the whole environment was pretty awful. So, no, look, um, I felt that if I couldn't command the confidence, you know, of the Prime Minister, the Labour Prime Minister, then, you know, I'd go back to doing what I enjoy, which being constituency MP. And I've always thought, what goes up can come down. Um, and for me, I, that was time to take some time out. We then lost, Labour then lost the 2010 general election and you then went again into the forefront of politics. You ran for the shadow cabinet. 
you were appointed to the shadow cabinet, firstly doing um, community and local government, and then what I think people will think of you a lot as, yeah. as the energy and climate change uh, spokesperson. Uh, the challenges of opposition are much more difficult. Uh, in a way, it's posturing in some ways. But I think I can say you had a reputation as somebody who was trying to form what the appropriate Labour strategy might be for mm. dealing with these issues in government and mm. taking on tough decisions and so on. Can you just talk about that period of leadership in opposition, which you were very directly involved in? Yeah, I mean, opposition, you know, you know, part of it is, you know, obviously you're scrutinising the government and then the other thing is coming up with new ideas which they may pinch, mm. which is, you know, and I have to say, um, particularly during, you know, the four years I was covering energy and climate change, I think there were a lot of policies that I was quite surprised the government didn't, didn't pinch. I know they weren't going to go for the price freeze, mm. but I think the actual, there clearly was a problem within the markets how energy was working mm. and, that, and that consumers were being ripped off in one way or another. And, you know, it seemed to me that, you know, it, if you believe in, in competition and the benefits of competition, that should mean that consumers get a better deal. And they clearly were not getting a better deal in this dominance by uh, the big six. But also in other areas, you know, uh, in terms of energy generation, um, uh, tackling climate change, you know, I think we were a very, strong and informed voice within the politics of that, uh, given that we had the coalition with the Conservatives having a somewhat different to, view to their Liberal Democrat partners as well. I think the other thing for me was, was that, um, which was maybe a bit different from Ed Miliband, who'd obviously held the post in, uh, in government, is that I wanted to find a way, and I suppose this has been, you know, a, a sort of an essence of my politics on every issue, brief that I've worked on, I want to find a way that um, we could connect with a wider group of people than the usual suspects. Of course, I had to work with all the NGOs and the green groups and, you know, obviously the energy sector. And it's a fascinating area, I have to say. But I also wanted to think about, well, how could we have a Labour uh, message to the public as well? And that's why, you know, the consumer side of what I did was important. Um, it's also why I wanted to talk about how actually a low carbon economy could provide some of the answers to the jobs of the future and the skills of the future. And, you know, I think I, I, think I did a speech was that um, uh, it's not just about the bears, you know, it's about the bills. Mm. And I did other speeches which is about, it's about the jobs and mm. what have you. Um, because to find a better way that this particular area wasn't going to be marginalised amongst the people who are already convinced by the need to tackle climate change, the problem was too often, and you know this, when you ask the public what do you, are important to you, they're going to talk about the economy, they're going to talk about jobs. And I wanted to make sure there was a very much an economic framing of that area as well. And I'm very pre proud of all of that work. It's a very personal judgment on my account, but I think you very much succeeded. I think it was one of the areas where Labour in opposition did look as though it had a coherent set of things to say, which could have been put into effect. In I think government. I had a very good team as well, and that's the other thing about opposition, is... <laughs> I used to sort of describe us as a small startup. Mm. Um, so I had, you know, in terms of my resourcing, I got paid out the short money, money for one political advisor. I then got some, um, uh, some help to have someone seconded. But pretty much it was our parliamentary staff mm. and my shadow ministers. And we basically tried to work, as I say, like a small startup team. And to that end, we had to be quite disciplined, Charles, yes. because we couldn't cover everything in detail. So we had to really pick the things we thought we could make a difference on. And I think it's well known uh, amongst um, uh, colleagues across the shadow cabinet, but also those people who work for the leader's office, that if there was a team they could trust to get on with things, it was Caroline's team. Were you surprised in 2015 by the result? Had you thought you might end up in office? Uh, you'd, you'd, you'd got to the top of Labour politics. You'd gone through this process, you'd resigned, you'd come through, you then put yourself back in, you'd gone through the issues and you were part of the shadow cabinet and um, a, a, a highly regarded member of the leadership team. Did you hope that it would be government office then again? I think we were all a bit, I suppose, fooled by the polls. But I think, you know, a couple of years before the general election, um, you know, I did uh, make speeches and write articles that we needed more than a 30, 35% strategy yeah. to win. Um, and even though on a number of areas, you know, that we're more in touch, we were doing well, we clearly weren't making the head road I felt we needed to, having gone through a number of other general elections over my time in the party. 
uh, on the economy, people's worries about immigration, people's worries about welfare. And I think too, you know, having, you know, having obviously been brought up in London in a big sort of city Labour politics, you know, 18 years in a more provincial part of Britain, Labour though it is, yeah. I could see the impact of UKIP in those areas as well getting into our vote too. But I also spent time in the Shadow Cabinet, if you like, as the regional champion for the South East. So I spent a lot of time in the South East. Mm. And we needed to win more of those seats. I mean, we were down to four, I know. you know, and it wasn't looking good in those areas either. I think other things happened as well. Uh, the referendum in Scotland mm. undoubtedly had a massive impact on us. Uh, but also, I think the Tories were very clever in their campaigning. I think Linton Crosby was worth his money. They paid him. I'm not sure the people we paid were worth as much money. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, so uh, you then had to decide what to do. Uh, Labour had been beaten. Yeah. There was a leadership election. Ed Miliband decided to stand down almost immediately. Harriet Harman decided to stand down at the same time. And you decided you'd give it a go to be deputy leader. That's another enormous change in your life. Yes. Um, you didn't go for leader, you went for deputy leader. Uh, you did pretty well in the election, you came third. I don't know if you did as well as you hoped to, but what drove you to say, I can be the deputy leader of the party at this time? I've, I've got it there to be able to do it. I think a combination of a number of things. I think partly because I think I'd prove myself as a leader in terms of being in the shadow cabinet, uh, that I could take on, you know, complex responsibilities. I think too I also felt that it was about time we had some people at the top of our party who you know reflected more you know a different type of politician mm. and the public and I think you know we look I don't I don't blame anyone but are we got into a situation where so many of the candidates are put forward they've all been they've all gone to either Oxford or Cambridge or they've all been you know special advisors or work for MPs um, and they become MPs quite early on in, in their sort of working lives. And I felt that as a party, you know, that clearly had been something, not just for the Labour Party, but I think for politics generally, a disenchantment had started to occur in the public's mind about who we were, who do we represent. I don't think that's always fair from the public because they only know a bit of everybody. Mm. Um, but certainly an impression left that we were out of touch, um, we were part of a political elite of our own, um, that was just sort of, you know, just whether whatever party you were, you were all part of that same <laughs> circus. And therefore I thought I could personally bring something of my own backstory that would be good for the party, for people in the party thinking they could become MPs, um, but also reach out beyond our party as well. And, um, and I had people around me who said, you know, you should go for it too. Did you uh, feel you did better or worse than you thought? Or do you think you could have done differently and done better? I'm, like look, I'm, I'm, well, I mean, it would be nice to have more money. Mm. I mean, I cannot tell, I have to say, when I've talked to members about, you know, what's involved on the money side, I think people have been, members have been quite shocked. I mean, to start with, we had to find £5,000 just to pay the Labour Party for the membership list mm. to have access to, which we then have to give back at the end of the process. And everything has to, I mean, be funded, you know, um, by yourselves and, and your team, and that's quite hard. I think probably, uh, I'll think about how I say this. Um, I think because of the nature of these elections, Charles, and because everything's involved, particularly on the money side and the organisation, it's no surprise that some people are thinking about this long before there's a vacancy. Yeah. And to that and end... Making preparations. Yeah. And to that end... And you, um, and you hadn't. I, to that end, I don't think I was as prepared as probably others may be. And maybe that's just something about politics. And again, it's this learning these things. But in terms of the campaign, um, I'm very proud of the campaign. I, I'm, I think, you know, for a lot of people, sharing more of my story about where I come from and what I'm about was an eye-opener. They only saw Caroline Flint through the lens of what the media present about you. Um, and, and therefore, for a lot of members who took part, particularly at the hustings, I was very proud of the hustings, Charles, because the party organised these hustings around the country. And, you know, honestly, I think I absolutely rocked them. And, uh, and I think I won them. If I could just have had the hustings for everywhere, 
it would have been a hell of a lot cheaper, but it would have been, you know, it would have been great. And I think in that sense, I mean, I, you know, sometimes at the hustings, I had, I had people coming up to me crying, mm. you know, and telling me a bit of your story was my story. And, you know, it was really humbling and, and to be able to, for them to come and share their experience with me as well. So I'm very proud of that. I'm also very proud of something else. I'm not the sort of politician who, depending who's in front of me, will slightly adjust my story, to, uh, my, my politics to suit that. I'm very proud of my politics. I'm a conviction politician. I'm, I hope I'm an authentic person. And even though sometimes it will mean that I'm not going to necessarily win everyone on my side, I like people to feel that they'll go away saying, do you know what, I didn't agree with her on that, yeah. but she was herself and she spoke truth. And I think I brought that to the campaign as well. And it's probably for others to say, but I think my respect rose, if you like, out of this. The other thing is, I have to say, if I had a tenor for everyone to say, why didn't you go for leader? They always tell you afterwards that, you know. <laughs> there wasn't a list of people in the run up to all this saying she's a rising star and this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I should have maybe got a tenor off each of them and that we could have had a nice holiday at the end of the process. Now, my yeah. final question, <laughs> and just to say, I'll, I'll then throw it open to the uh, audience. I'm sorry I've gone on longer than I should have done sorry, because got you've got such a gripping story, actually. <laughs> Um, you then decided, Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader, yeah. that you weren't going to be a member of his shadow cabinet. There was a lot of controversy mm. uh, around, within the party, uh, people who uh, weren't supportive of Jeremy Corbyn. Some said it's very important to get in there. Some said, actually, I'm not going to get in there. Um, can you just talk through your own thought process, which led yeah. you to say yeah. you wouldn't be part yeah. of it? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, when I, obviously this came up during the deputy leadership contest mm. itself. Um, and, um, you know, people say, well, if you're deputy leader, how are you going to work with Jeremy? And I said, and I think part of my answer to that was, well, as deputy leader, one thing is, is you have a direct mandate yourself and you are elected by the members. It's not patronage. And in that situation, I, you know, felt that, you know, whoever became leader, um, I had a, an authority uh, to be able to, not in a negative way, but to be able to speak truth to mm. that person uh, with the mandate that I had. Um, and I thought that was important. I think being in the shadow cabinet, you know, you are being invited in. Mm. You know, it is patronage, particularly now because we don't have elections to the shadow cabinet. I was very proud after uh, 2010 to actually it. win, given yeah. that I'd gone out in a, you know, a blaze of glory, mm. you know, from, uh, from government before. So it is about patronage, but also I think too, is that I, I wanted to have some space to be able to feel that I could talk about other subject areas that when you're just doing a portfolio, you, you can't. I think part of my time during the deputy leadership campaign made me reflect more about my life story and about my concerns about the lack of social mobility we still have in our country and that I could do something more about that. Um, and rather than potentially end up in a situation where you're given a portfolio and you have to stick with that. You can't dip into other areas. And to have some freedom, I think, um, from um, the absolute right confine, you know, the confines you have in the shadow cabinet was an opportunity that I wanted. I think too as well, you know, in all honesty, I did feel that, you know, on some areas, there might be some disagreements um, down the road where I wanted to have some freedom on that as well. Mm. Um, and be able to, you know, not in a negative way, but in an honest way, try and speak up for the fact that since the general election in 2015, this year, we've been constantly talking to ourselves. Mm. And we still are. We're not actually really getting out there and asking the public, why didn't you support us in the general election? What is it that we need to know about why, given that Cameron wasn't a popular prime minister, that all things being equal, we were in equal, we were in with a shout. Mm. Why did it go wrong? Um, and and I felt I could be, if you like, a you know, a standard bearer for speaking out of our party and not losing sight of that better on the back benches than in Shadow Cabinet. Which you've been doing. Which I've been doing. <laughs> it's an extraordinary life you've described, Caroline, really extraordinary, tremendous achievement. Questions to Caroline. Uh, as, as always we've got people, I think we've got people with mics, yes. Uh, can you just put, got, first I've got a guy down here, guy over there, do you want to take the guy just there with the uh, uh, red jumper? Yeah, that one just there, yep. Yeah. 
Reeves. Mm, fine. Hello. Um, when I was looking you up beforehand... C can, you, can you just give your name, yep, please? Yeah, Tony Allen, a uh, sixth form student. Um, when I was looking you up beforehand, I found an article in The Guardian from March that highlighted that women are still less likely to vote than men. Now, we had Harriet Harman here a mm. while back. I just wanted to know what you thought about her actions and also what you would do uh, to encourage more women to vote. Would you support all female lists, for example, for seats? Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman just here, and then I'll take a third before going to Caroline. I'll take uh, the lady there. But So, gentleman just here, please, and then the lady just there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, following the... Sorry, can you just give your name again, please? Uh, sorry, Chris Christopher Dunlop. I work here at QEA. Yeah. Um, with the leadership election campaign for Labour, um, we had a huge number of people doubling or trebling the membership, something like that. Um, a huge number of young people, obviously a real explosion of interest. Um, clearly there isn't the same support for Jeremy Corbyn within the Parliamentary Party, but, but what do you personally draw from that huge increase in interest, huge increase in young people wanting to get involved in a party? What, uh, you know, and obviously wanting a change from what had gone before. What, what, what change do you think should happen now, please? Thank you. The lady there. Hi, uh, Cable Hi, uh, Rick. I'm a local Labour Party member and actually came here to Norwich to go to come to the university just a few years before you. Um, but I was at school a decade or so before you and I was very interested to hear how influential it seemed to be um, that your going to an all-girls school was in your development. Mm. And I also went to an all-girls school and I think it's very important. And I just wonder what your views are about education for segregated education. Okay, okay. thank you. That's three, three so questions. To so, Tony, um, well, I think Harriet has been, you know, an amazing inspiration to so many women, not just those involved in politics, but I think outside of politics as well. I mean, you know, when she first got elected, that, you know, there were so few women, and here was this, you know, young woman, you know, I think she was, I think she was pregnant when she was out on the campaign trail when she got elected in the first place. And, um, and of course, in 1997, we uh, managed to have 101 Labour women MPs, and we used women-only shortlists in half, I think it was, of our key seats, target seats, uh, to try and make sure that we achieved that. Now, I happened to get um, selected in an open selection, but I absolutely believe that actually women-only shortlists were vital to us increasing the number of women. Now, I, you know, I've sometimes said, you know, we'll have true equality when women can be as mediocre as some of the men, um, because... <laughs> do, do you name names when you do that? <laughs> Might save that for the memoirs. <laughs> but the, um, but the truth, because, you know, th when we've ever had these discussions in the party and, and over many years, you know, um, we want to have, you know, more training, more development and what have you. But in different ways, it wasn't always um, fair in the way in which selections happened. I mean, as I said, before one member, one vote, it was a delegates committee, and, you know, that was quite hard. And that. We used to have a situation where, you know, at uh, a, a nomination meetings, not everybody got the same questions, so undoubtedly, often, if it was a woman, it would be, well, what if you have kids? I know it sounds a bit crass, that, but, I mean, those things happen. Now, you can't, you can't do anything about what people are thinking in their heads, but you can do something about trying to make sure these things are fair. And women, are, look, I haven't heard anything from any other political party about what we do to get the uplift we need to have more women as MPs. And, and it's not just MPs, it's councillors as well. And for me, it's a means to the end. And I have, I have seen no evidence to suggest that those women MPs that came through that route were less able and less qualified. Often they feel they have to prove more and they work even harder uh, to achieve. But the truth is, you know, you can't have more women and have the same number of men. It, it, that's just the way it is. Um, people the who came questions, into the party. Uh, the people yeah, who came into the party. Yeah, speaking, yeah. Uh, look, you know, we. I think it's look. I think it's great that more people join the party. What's quite interesting for me when I've looked at my own figures in my own constituency is actually seeing some of those people who joined straight after the general election. And that wasn't really anything to do necessarily with the leadership thing. There might have been, because Ed went quickly. And to be honest, I think Ed went too quickly. I think it left a, a vacuum 
uh, in what we were doing and put huge, resp huge responsibility on Harriet's shoulders in those circumstances. And she'd been there before, don't forget. Um, um, and so, I, so, and then there are people who joined under the three pound rate as well. I personally think that running uh, the open-ended way right up to two days before the ballot, I'm not sure that's particularly fair. I do wonder, and I'll probably be, have loads of people come on social media saying that is terrible, but I do wonder whether actually the cut-off point should have happened before the final shortlist um, uh, occurred, and I'm sure there are lots of people who disagree with me. But we are where we are, and undoubtedly, you know, thousands, many thousands more took part than would have done otherwise. There is a question, though, about whether people are just joining to vote for someone and whether they're going to be active in their constituency party. And I think the jury's out on that, to be honest. Um, but also, you know, I, I think we have to also remind ourselves about young people. I think when I looked at some figures, uh, something like 12% of Jeremy's support was under 35. So I know there's an image which is good and it's right, but actually it was a lot older than that. Now, the other, here's the other thing I would say too. We absolutely lost it in 2015 when it came to older voters. Labour has always, and I don't want to be complacent about it, but Labour has always done better amongst younger voters. Um, but actually under older voters, we are tanking. Um, the Tories across the country are winning uh, amongst the over 65s, but they're winning amongst the over 50s as well. And in 2020, over the half the people who vote will be over the age of 50 or 55. So we've got to find a better way. And look, I'm in my early 50s now, and as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's the new 30. But <laughs> <laughs> we are living longer, and therefore, of course, it's important to involve young people. And I got involved, you know. But actually, we shouldn't disregard that ever-growing group of people who don't want to be pigeonholed as an older person in the way maybe our grandparents were, who actually are dealing with a whole load of complex issues. I mean, if you're a woman in your early 50s, you're often having to deal with a situation of older parents who need your support, and then your grandkids with your kids who are needing it as well. And these women pinched in the middle of all that. I have to say, there's a lot of people in their 50s and 60s who don't want to be carers. They think, I've worked all my life. Do you know what? I want a bit of fun. And why shouldn't they, you know? So I think, and I've got an article coming out um, later this month, I think Labour really has to address some of the issues around older voters as well. Because at every single one of the deputy leadership hustings, I was asked about young voters. I think it was only one that someone asked me about older voters. And if we don't get them in bigger numbers, we will not win the next general election. Single-sex schools? Single-sex schools. Well, what do they say? They say single-sex schools good for girls, but mixed schools for boys. Um, it's difficult, this, isn't it? Um, I mean, I can only be honest, and, but, the, but then I've got nothing to compare it with. Maybe if I'd gone to a good mixed school, it would have been just as good for me. For me, it's about good schooling. I feel very angry that after 11 years of compulsory education, too many of our children are leaving school without a qualification worth the paper it's written on. I feel very angry when I see in my own constituency and elsewhere that children leave primary school and go into that really difficult transition to secondary school in year <coughs> seven. And if they haven't got the foundation blocks, and that is around reading and numeracy, but it's also about social confidence as well, speaking up and speaking out, they can get lost in those mammoth secondary schools that exist and lose their way. Um, and for me, it's got to be about good schooling. But within mixed education, uh, we have to be, make sure we're aware of what sometimes goes on, where either directly or indirectly, we don't give enough support uh, to girls within that environment. Now, having said that, it does look like on all the indicators that girls are doing very well when it comes to passing the exams. But that doesn't necessarily follow through into their working life. So it's about good education, I think, in all of this. And maybe within, sorry, no, maybe no, no. within mixed schools, there's a role for sometimes having certain activities done just single sex for small periods with that. I think we can be creative and flexible about that. But it's about good schooling at the end of the day. OK, more questions. Gentlemen over there, uh, to see how many have I got? Quite a number all around. I'll do 
I'll be going for two more rounds. Can we? I'll take the that gentleman there. I'll well. take more than three. Then I'm going right up the back. So there's a couple right in the back row. So firstly you, then the gentleman there, then the gentleman there. And I'm also going to take two up the back, so five in this round. OK, can I write their names? <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Charles. Uh, my name's Chris Noble, Chris. former uh, student here at UEA, 79 to uh, 82. Um, a couple of things, first of all. In respect of um, the new uh, membership and the large influx in party members, the jury isn't out. The decision, I think, is that they are not fully engaging in the, uh, in the party. They may have joined many affiliates and three pound members, but so far I've yet to see them actually uh, fully participate in, uh, in uh, party affairs. Uh, and you probably realise, those around me and behind me, that I'm a, a, I'm a representative of the, uh, of the baby boomers. And this, uh, this, uh, the coalition and this government, of course, have been very clever in uh, setting their stall out and uh, appealing to the, um, uh, that age. Chris, can you move quickly through? Yeah, what, what, number what my question is, Caroline, you've looked back and, the, and what the position of you and the party is now. Can we look forward a year and to 2020 and where do we go from here if we're to <laughs> succeed in wrestling uh, power in the general election 2020? Thank you. The gentleman behind there, right behind, that's right. Hi, I'm Owen Willis, and I'm studying PPE here at the uni. Um, and I'd like to ask that in light of the year of coalition strikes in Syria against ISIL, which has seen Saudi, Qatar, Bahrain, Jordan, uh, Canada, and Australia withdraw their air forces, um, alongside reports from senior US, official, um, U.S. Army officials that their strikes in Syria have not seen any significant decrease in territory or numbers. What motivated you to vote in favour of British strikes in the region last night? Okay. okay. And then there's a gentleman just in front here. There's a guy in the coat just here. That's right. Yep. And then I'm going right up the back. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Chris, a PhD student at the Climatic Research Unit, just up the road. Um, it's the Paris climate change talks happening right now. Um, back in 2009, the Sustainable Development Commission, uh, which was put up by the Labour government, released a report called Prosperity Without Growth that talked about the paradigm of perpetual economic growth and how it's not uh, consistent with the idea of decarbonising our economy. I was wondering if you had any comments on uh, whether you agree or disagree with that. Okay. Thank you. And there's a couple right in the back row up there, please. Yep. Hello, uh, my name's Bob Keynes. Um, I'd just ask a question. What lessons can Labour draw on from the early 80s, which both of you were a major part of, uh, part of the Labour Party? What lessons do you think the Labour Party could learn from that time, considering what's going to happen over next Okay, few lessons from the early 80s. And finally, there was somebody else up there. Maybe, oh yes, that's right. That's it. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Sophia Mins. I'm, I'm a student, same school as Tony. What was your name, sorry? Sophia Mins. Sophia. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if you have any advice or tips for young people pursuing a career in politics? Okay. Five good questions for you oh, there. Right, uh, okay. Uh, so, on. look, in, well, first of all, I think, you know, in, for 2020, I mean, I really do think we, we need to reflect on why we lost this year. I mean, I really do. Um, because um, if we don't engage with that, then I think, you know, it's going to be really difficult. And in some ways, you know, I know everyone's always looking for a new idea and, and you, know, you know, and politics does change, undoubtedly it does, and for good reasons it should. But for, I suppose for me, you know, it always just comes down to some basics. You know, people want to know that you, you know, you're going to run the economy. Um, they may not talk in the terms of the economy, but they talk about, are we going to have jobs? Are you going to spend money wisely? You know, we want to be reassured about that. They want to know that their concerns that they're dealing with, and when, you know, there's no doubt about it, we're going to have this EU referendum coming up for a start. And we all know that some of the issues around immigration are going to come into play with that, so we've got to think about that as well. 
And there are also some issues around fairness, around welfare too. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean that we concede to a UKIP agenda on these issues, but I think we have to engage on it and to understand where people are coming from. And again, just going back to what I've said earlier, we, our cities have done amazingly well in the last 10 to 15 years. And I think actually the last Labour government had an important part to play in the renaissance of our cities. London isn't like it is today, 20, 25 years ago. Glasgow, Edinburgh, you know, other places as well, smaller cities like Norwich too. There has been a renaissance. But there's parts of our country, those provincial small towns and communities that, you know, have maybe lost their luster uh, and the glory of the days they had in the past. And they feel quite detached from things too. So when we talk about the economy and jobs, you know, we can talk about what's happening in our big cities, but for many of those places in the country, it doesn't reach out. And that, that plays into their sense of insecurity and then when they think um, there's unfairness for others getting a bigger share of the pie than they are as well. So I think the economy is important to that, but it's got to be an economy that speaks to lots of different types of communities as well um, and how they can do And then within that is the hope for the future as well about what people need. And that is tackling some of the things about we're all living longer, what we need for social care, but it's also about housing those other things as well. But we've got to make sure we're looking outwards and listening on, on all those fronts. On the issue around last night and why I voted the, the way I did, well, I mean, I, th I think there's other evidence to, to, to show that there has been some success with the airstrikes in Iraq. Um, ISIL Daesh were advancing on Baghdad when we decided to step in, and I think we did, uh, with others, put a stop to them overtaking Baghdad and to reduce them back in uh, their expansion plans. Now, for me, one of the biggest arguments about why we should extend our ability to be involved in airstrikes in Syria is that we've got a theatre here. Look, there's another thing going on, of course, in terms of what's happening in terms of the civil war in Syria. But if I just confine myself to ISIL Daesh for a moment, we've got a theatre in which they do not recognise a border. And the operations of this terrorist organisation in Iraq and in Syria are there to try and work with each other. Now, we are already in Syria providing intelligence to other air forces to uh, carry out strikes. We are involved in refueling and logistics and reconnaissance as well. So what we've got in the moment is, and someone described it to me, we've got RAF planes up in the air on that line of the border in Iraq ready to take command of what we need to do. And when, I talk about, when they talk about target bombing, they're talking about the oil fields, they're talking about when there are people on the move who they need to basically take out. They're planning terrorist plots against us and other places around the world, as well as killing people within the areas they dominate. It's about the command centers and communications. So we have an RAF plane up in the air, just on the wrong side of the border in Iraq. They're working in a coalition with partners and the intelligence comes through that actually we've, there is some movement, there's a convoy happening with oil supplies, who's nearest to getting, doing something about that? And you've got an RAF plane where it's actually a minute away, but they can't go over that border because they're not extended to sign up to do that. That seems to me uh, ridiculous. We're already there, we're already involved. This is about making sure that we can use our expertise, which I think is actually making an impact in Iraq, but also the type of bombs we've got, the precision bombing that we can do, which is far superior to what some of the other forces are able to deliver. Is it the only answer? No, it isn't. We will have to fight ISIL Daesh, not just in a military way, but in terms of economically, diplomatically, but also in terms of information and communications as well, particularly back here at home to some of those people who are thinking that they should support this organisation. And then outside of that, we've got the peace process. Now, nobody has any certainty of what's going to happen with these Vienna talks. But I do think that our involvement now, the extended role we have now, allows us to play a bigger role politically at the table of discussion that is happening. And it is difficult, it is complicated. But we have a Uni United Nations Security Council resolution and we have some of the players, difficult though that is, prepared to sit down and talk about a future beyond Assad. And ultimately, can we degrade ISIL in such a way that if there is a chance of a transitional government, and with some of the elements who at the moment who are involved in a civil war coming together, 
that actually they are not impeded by an ever-growing, ever-stronger uh, Islamist fascist organisation, which is what ISIL is. So, so let's go yeah. fairly quickly through the last yeah. three, because I, yeah, sorry. I, it's my fault. I've let the thing run on longer than so I... So on, on Paris, I, I think actually bringing together the development goals with fighting climate change are really important. And in the last few years, my work in this area is to look at how actually, through offering support for a low carbon future, particularly for those countries who in, they want something that we've got, they want development, but if we can help them to do that in a low carbon way, it can be one of the ways to tackle some of the poverty issues as well they face. And I think it is actually about that you can have clean development and growth alongside each other as well. I do believe that. Well, no, but I think what some of these countries would like, they'd like the ability to have, you know, light. They'd like the ability to have warmth. And one of the things that the new technologies through clean energy can provide is to leapfrog where, we've, where we are to some of those technologies that can help for people's of schools to run, for hospitals to run, but also to create jobs and opportunities as well. It's not, all, it's not about, you know, I can't sort of say how much growth that would be, but I do think... Part of the thing is how do you create sustainable economies in these countries as well? And actually part of the answer to that is good governance and tackling corruption too. And that, I think that's important for that. And then quickly, lessons from the 80s. Well, I did see a poster tonight in the Student Union. And one thing that I have learned is that if you've got a good tune, you can carry on forever and Human League are on tour. Um, um, look, I, I think for me, you know, part of those 18 years, I joined 97, 18 years out of power. It said to me, there's no such thing as a perfect Labour government. The only alternative to a Labour government is going to be a Tory one. And I think part of you know, my lessons is, is if you're not in power, you are impeded from doing great things. And actually one of the sad things about the last five years is we didn't actually do enough to talk about some of the very good things in 13 years that Labour government did from 1997 uh, to uh, 2010. And on young people, Sophia, I would say... Get involved. I'm a bit, I don't want to say dismissive, that might sound unfair. When people apply for a job with me and I look at their CV, I try to, and they say, I want to work for a Labour MP. And I want to say, why? So what have you done at university? What, what campaigns have you been involved in? And they might say, oh, they study politics. But theory is one thing. It's getting, getting stuck in is completely different. So I'm really interested in you know, the campaigns, and, and it doesn't have to be a party political campaign, but the sort of things that actually people like to get involved in. And I think that's really important. Um, for me, being a member of parliament, I feel I've taken great strength from having a life uh, that is outside of politics, but also being that grassroots activist. And, and having, I, I was chair of a childcare organisation, for example, for a number of years. All those things have meant for me my politics is not just about the theory, it's about putting what you believe into practice. So my advice is, you know, get involved, because when you want to maybe stand for office as a councillor or to become an MP, you will find that incredibly important to express yourself to those people whose trust you're trying to gain about the type of person you are, where you've come from, and what you can offer to them for the future. That is a fantastic way for finishing this evening. Um, I do apologise to those who've wanted to get questions in and can't uh, because of time. We've run significantly over where we are. Caroline, you've been very clear, very direct, very open. Uh, I, you can tell from the way people are responding they've appreciated the way you've uh, gone about this. So can I, on behalf of everybody, just thank you so much for coming this evening. <laughs>